Good evening, my name is Mike Bush from News Channel 5, and it's an honor to be here tonight. As we recognize the 20th anniversary of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. Throughout the evening, you're gonna hear about the event's theme, remember, honor, act, make a difference, and how it reflects the organization's mission. Now, I have a connection with the Holocaust Museum. Years ago, I was asked to be the voice of the guided audio tour that we have there. We went into a studio with a very long script to work on the recording, and watching over me were about uh, 10 people, including a couple of rabbis, to make sure I didn't mess up any of the pronunciations. You have to remember, I, I was bar mitzvahed, but I really didn't remember a whole lot of Hebrew. My grandfather came over from this country, from Russia, in 1923, and he knew Hebrew, and he'd come to our house every Sunday. But what I remember about those visits is he didn't really speak Hebrew, he spoke Yiddish. And what I remember as a kid, the, his three most favorite words were shlemiel, meshugana, and putz. So it's a uh, good thing those rabbis were there because uh, those words never really came up in the audio tour. <laughs> the, the great thing about my job and getting to be in broadcast journalism is having the opportunity to meet and interview some extraordinary people. I've sat down with President Obama at the White House. I've had the opportunity to interview senators and governors and World Series winning managers and Super Bowl MVPs. But here's the thing, those aren't always the people I remember the most. The people I remember the most when I get to do stories on extraordinary people. Some of you are in this room tonight, people like Ben Fainer, people like Eric Dahl. I did a story on Eric Dahl years ago at the J. Eric was along with his sisters, was kicked out of a school in Germany just for being Jewish. He and his sisters escaped the Holocaust, but his parents didn't survive. He ended up coming here to the U.S., where he served in the U.S. Army, and eventually became one of the all-time greats at the Senior Olympics. For me, interviewing and meeting people like that, and Ben Fainer and so many others, those are the stories that really stay with me. And that's why I'm very honored to be here tonight. <laughs> to get things started, it's my pleasure to introduce the co-chairs of tonight's event, Margie Lenga Khan and Carol Steinberg. Good evening. Last year when we started to plan this event, we were hoping to get about 400 people. Tonight, we have nearly 650. Thank you. And it's the largest that the Holocaust Museum has ever had. So thank you for being here. The Holocaust Museum Fundraising Dinner offers tangible evidence that our mission and me message resonates across our community. The record participation would not have been possible without the support of each of you and the generosity of the evening sponsors, whose names are listed in the programs at your tables. We are here to mark the 20th anniversary of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center to remember, honor, act, and make a difference. Tonight we are going to take a brief walk down memory lane to remember those who were here at the very beginning, to honor the work they did to make this institution possible, and to highlight our museum's programs over the past 20 years. It is through these programs and museum exhibits that we challenge all visitors to act and to make a difference in our community and throughout the world. 
Throughout the evening, you will hear from museum staff, volunteers, and visitors, and learn about our mission and our programs. More importantly, by hearing from survivors, young museum guests, and educators, you will feel the emotional impact of the Holocaust Museum on our guests and on the larger community. I'm Margie, by the way, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here this evening. Oh, and by the way, Carol, it has been a pleasure working with you. And it's not just her curly hair. <laughs> In the room tonight are people who have helped shape and sustain the Holocaust Museum, and people whose lives have been truly shaped by it. We encourage you to get to know everyone at your table during dinner. After all, making connections is what this museum is really all about. At this time, we would like to thank our committee members, Vera Emmons, Nancy Kaiser, Myrna Meyer, Lynn Palin, Marcy Rosenberg, and Jamie Rudman Weiss. Their efforts, along with those of their respective committee members, made this evening's event possible. Thank you so much. We would also like to thank the dignitaries in the room tonight, uh, Clayton Mayor Harold Sanger, State Senator Jill Shoup, Missouri Court of Appeals Judge Patricia Cohn, Supreme Court of Missouri Judge Richard B. Teitelman, University City Councilwoman, Councilman Stephen Kraft, and Councilwoman of Olivet, Maxine Weil. And now I'd like to turn the podium back over to our MC, Mike Bush. Thank you very much. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, the President and CEO of the Jewish Federation of St. Louis, Dr. Andrew Rayfeld. Hi, it's really a, um, <clears throat> an honor and pleasure to be here tonight. Could we have a hand again for the extraordinary work that Margie and Carol have done to bring us together? It's extraordinary to look out at this community here tonight that's gathered today. Uh, when I began this position three years ago, I spoke uh, increasingly of the idea of the Jewish Federation being a community development organization, an organization that provides a platform for individuals and a support of institutions and congregations in our community to find a pathway for anyone to make Judaism part of a life well lived. We are proud that the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center are part of the Jewish Federation, really a gem in the many of the things that we support and that in fact as a department of our organization exists. A good part of the reason the Holocaust Museum serves this function is because of the extraordinary way that they have turned, ironically, a memorial to the destruction of our community into a very platform for building community, building community within the Jewish community and building community, turning it outward and making something of profound importance to anyone who wants to live and learn according to Jewish values based on the history therein. We're proud of that and we're delighted for all of you to be here to celebrate with that. Before I go, I do want to say one thing and that is that as the uh, CEO of the Jewish Federation, I have the honor of calling as my staff the woman who in the mornings uh, carries around a coffee cup and pops into my office and calls me boss. And I'd like you all, if you would, to uh, thank the extraordinary work of the director, Gene Cavender, along with,
along with the staff of Dan Rich and Andrew Goldfeder, who together who together over these 20 years have made this institution what it is, along with the volunteers that you'll be hearing so much more about. Thank you so much. And without further ado, let's bring up the director of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. No, no, no. Oh, Kent. Oh, we got to do Kent first. OK. I don't have that, so Kent, come on up. By, by the way, in case you didn't hear as you all sat down, we have a purse here that was left up in the lobby uh, during the uh, uh, cocktail hour, so if anybody claims it, uh, here it is. Uh, Andrew, I want to thank you, uh, and I want to thank Federation for their continued support of uh, the Holocaust Museum over the last two decades. It's a privilege to be a chair of the museum, especially during its 20th year. Since we opened our doors 20 years ago, we have been a valuable educational resource to everyone who has toured the museum, learned, listened to our dedicated speakers, and learned the valuable lessons we strive to teach. When you do what you do, what we do, and you do it as well as we have, you gain the respect and recognition of your peers and of your community, and you receive letters like the one I'd like to share with you now. Dear friends, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center of St. Louis. From its inception, the museum was called to be much more than an institution of remembrance. It would also be a true center for learning. The Holocaust Museum and Learning Center was established as a living memorial to those who lost their lives, and it continues to inspire citizens to confront hatred and promote human dignity. The museum's devotion to remembrance remains as critical today as it was 20 years ago. To remember, is to allow the past to move into the future and shape its course. To remember is to acknowledge the postulate that time leaves traces and scars on the surface of history, that all events are intertwined, all gates open to the same quest for truth. To remember is to reconcile justice to dignity, to affirm man's faith in humanity, and to convey meaning on our fleeting endeavors. With great pride, I congratulate you for the excellent work you continue to do to educate the St. Louis community and beyond to ensure that the tragedies of the past are never forgotten. With warm wishes and deep gratitude, Ellie Wiesel. Thank you. Ken, thank you. And I think that's one of our missions tonight as we leave here, is to let people know about the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. We all know about it, that's why we're here, but I know that for me, I told a few people that I was coming here to do this dinner, and they said, oh, there's a Holocaust Museum in St. Louis? We need to let people know about this. And then getting a letter from Ellie Wiesel, that is quite an honor. Now, I'd like to ask Gene Cavender, the director, to come on up. Thanks, Kent, Andrew, and Mike. Appreciate you all being here today. Um, first, let me thank Margie and Carol for co-chairing this event and making it such a success. Your leadership truly made a difference because either one or both of you were involved in every aspect of shaping the experience we will have here together tonight. We are proud of what the Holocaust Museum has accomplished in its first 20 years. Before this anniversary year ends, we will have hosted a half a million visitors. I have the privilege of working every day with two of the most dedicated professionals anywhere. 
museum curator and director of education, Dan Rich, and, An <laughs> and Andrew Goldfeder, our manager of programs and logistics. We are a staff of three, and the museum could not operate without the support of our volunteers who facilitate much of our daily work with tours and working in the office. Special thanks to you, our donors, whose generosity makes everything we do possible. And we are delighted to see so many good friends of the museum, colleagues whose work in social justice diversity awareness and inclusion complements our own, and I'd like to recognize those who are with us tonight. Batya Abramson Goldstein of the Jewish Community Relations Council, Karen Aresti, director of the Anti-Defamation League, Rina Hajat Carroll, executive director of the Diversity Awareness Partnership, Amy Waymeyer, Executive Director of Paraquad. Karen Kalish, Founder of Cultural Leadership. Nancy Lisker of the American Jewish Committee. And David Auten of Interfaith Partnership. We got a gift today. Senator Shoup brought this in. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a whereas, whereas, whereas. <laughs> but it basically states about the importance of the work that we do and what we've been doing for the past 20 years. And thank you so much for this honor. <laughs> Finally, this year we were honored to be selected by Focus St. Louis for What's Right with the Region Award for our commitment to improving racial equality and social justice. Such recognition by our esteemed colleagues at Focus meant so much, and it's just further evidence that our work is valued, needed, and wanted in our community. Thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you, Jean. I'd like now to ask Rabbi Jim Bennett, of Congregation Sher Emmett, to come up and lead us in the blessing before the meal. For those who want to wash before the blessing, there are two hand-washing stations located in the back of the ballroom. An evening like tonight reminds us to be grateful for humility and for aspiration, for memory and for blessing, and so we join together in giving thanks for the food we share and for this community and for the privilege of the work that we do. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz Blessed are you God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Enjoy your meal. We'll be back shortly. Everybody, if they could look up here um, and smile, you're, you're going on the Twitter page. Everybody smile. All right, one, two, three, go. Perfect. Thank you very much. I hope you had a chance to get acquainted with anybody who was, might have been a stranger at your table and that you didn't know well before tonight. Earlier, I mentioned my grandfather. He, uh, he'd come over to our house every Sunday. And after dinner, we'd watch Ed Sullivan. Hopefully some of you remember Ed Sullivan. His favorite comedian was Alan King. He also loved Shecky Green and Henny Youngman, and then he'd just laugh and laugh. I remember being just a kid and watching him laugh. And then he'd come back the next week and he'd repeat the jokes. He said, last year I took my wife on a trip around the world. This year she says, let's go someplace else. A Jewish boy comes home from school and tells his mother he auditioned and got a part in the play. She asks, what part is it? The boy says, I play the part of a Jewish husband. The mother scowls says, go back and tell the teacher you want a speaking part. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, 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 I know. Now I'd like to ask tonight's co-chairs, Margie Langa Khan and Carol Steinberg, to start the second portion of our program. Come on back up. Hope everyone enjoyed your meal. Um, there's one group associated with our museum that deserves special recognition, and the group is our local Holocaust survivors. It is their generous donations. It is their general don donation, generous donations of precious family photos and artifacts that bring our museum to life. And it is their willingness to bravely share their experiences that were in many instances too painful for them to even share with their own families. It is because of their passionate dedication that the lessons of the Holocaust continue to reach as many people as they do. Years before a museum was envisioned, survivors and community members had the foresight to create a St. Louis Center for Holocaust Studies that preceded this museum. You can find those people's names listed in tonight's program. So it is with gratitude and humili humility that we ask the Holocaust survivors who are with us tonight to stand and be recognized. Stand, if you will. the living embodiment of tonight's theme. You have made a difference, and for that we, rem we remember your work in the very beginning. We honor all that you have given and shared with our community, and we pledge to act in ways that carry your legacy forward. So tonight, We've heard about the impact of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center on visitors, on the community, and beyond. The video we are about to present provides details about the breadth and depth of the Holocaust Museum's programs and resources. Let's go to the videotape. I always knew that the Holocaust existed, but before I came to the museum, I had only ever learned about it in a more informal setting. A museum like the Holocaust Museum is really important. A museum like this really opens your eyes to the Holocaust. The museum itself is a gift. It's a gift where people can come and learn the truth and see for themselves and hear for themselves what has happened so that this cannot happen again. There was a big push for Holocaust learning, Holocaust education. And St. Louis was one of those in the forefront. These people who they don't even see as human anymore. We had one very strong group of people, Leo Wolf, myself, and Bill Kahn. And we wanted to see a Holocaust and Learning Center, but we didn't have any money to do that. The Federation was able to get a major donor in Sam Goldstein. And this place is not just a bridge to the history of what happened to the Jews, and not just a bridge to German history, but it's really a bridge to international history. And, and St. Louis needs more of that. The 
Holocaust Museum and Learning Center is proud to be a department of the Jewish Federation of St. Louis. And by the end of this year, we will have toured a half million people. From the very beginning, the idea was that the museum would convey both the history and the lessons of the Holocaust. Most of the people who come through this museum, World War II and the Holocaust is ancient history. 99% of the people that come to this museum are people of other faiths and traditions. So that was what kind of grabbed you the most was actually the pictures. What we try to do in terms of the mission of this organization is to really get people to think about the fact that one person can make a difference and to not stand idly by when you see social injustice occur. And because they learned a lesson here, they make a difference in their world. History repeats itself and it's important to learn from mistakes and it's important to look in the past to make sure that it doesn't happen again. This museum, unlike some of the others, is specifically, it has to be St. Louis related. Everything in our archives has a St. Louis connection. A call was put out to survivors veterans, other witnesses who were involved in this history to come forward with artifacts, photographs, letters. There are materials coming in all the time. Everything from a priceless shoe, Nazi propaganda items, to passports. It runs the whole range of things. We get about 30,000 students a year that come through the Holocaust Museum. And when they have the opportunity to hear from a Holocaust survivor, it really hits home and helps them understand more about what they learn through our main exhibit. Children learn a lot. They may not say anything, but they, in their hearts, they know. And they pass it on to their children. We heard a beautiful Holocaust survival story. And have you ever been attacked physically? It happened to me many times. That was the second one I've heard in my life, and you can learn something new each time, even though it's the same event. Today, there are people who deny the Holocaust ever occurred. Several people were saying just how wonderful it was to be able to hear from a survivor, and we really are lucky for that because we're the last generation who will ever have that experience. The children should know what goes on. But they have nightmares. And I went to sleep. Someone from Women's Division Federation asked me to speak, and I had never talked before an audience, and I said yes. I actually saw what happened. The garden is meant to be a space for reflection and solitude. The six benches represent the six million Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust, and the pavers are purchased and inscribed with a tribute to a loved one or a memorial message reminding us of those who have passed on. Docents play an important role with the museum as they give approximately 62,000 volunteer hours to tour more than 500 groups annually. These are people that, the, that volunteered for the job. German soldiers who volunteered to do the work because you got extra pay. We conduct quite a few lectures, conferences for educators. We give them the tools to enhance their Holocaust curriculum in the classroom, and we do it all for free. Through the Rubin and Gloria Feldman Family Education Institute, the museum has been able to forge new partnerships and strengthen existing ones to bring quality Holocaust education to our community. Soon after the museum opened, we determined that what we needed was a trunk program, wherein teachers could use the trunks for a month at a time for free. We also have our art and writing contest. The goals and the mission of the art and writing contest are for us to reach as many students as possible around the St. Louis area. And it's just to educate them about what we do at the Holocaust Museum and to give them an avenue to express themselves either with the written word or through art. It's evident through their writing that their visit really has changed their life for the better. Another very important program for us is our Sunday afternoon film program. I'm a historian of modern Europe. I give regular lectures in their film series and introduce the film and lead a discussion afterwards. As a Holocaust survivor, I wanted to be able to reach as many people as possible. So I thought that if we have a film 
that we can show about the Holocaust, it would encounter a lot more people. Law enforcement in society uses the history of the Holocaust to help police understand why their role in society nowadays can be so acute. There's one department who had years of difficulty. The new chief brought the department through in its entirety within a three-month period. And he said, our discourtesy complaints dropped like a stone right after the program. The Marilyn and Arthur Gale Family Lecture allows us to bring in prominent scholars in the field of Holocaust study. I said, I, I think this is something we need to do in oral history. If we had somebody that wanted to speak, we asked them if they wanted to give a testimony. They wanted to talk. We've interviewed, on audio tape, it was it's 330. We have others. In 2006, the museum established a writing workshop for Holocaust survivors called The Memory Project. Under the guidance of Dr. Robert Hutchison, survivors developed writing skills while sharing their Holocaust memories and insights through prose and poetry. These writings are now on view on the museum's website, hmlc.org. Yom HaShoah is a community-wide commemoration featuring eyewitness accounts of the Holocaust from survivors and witnesses. People come from all parts of the community to join together to memorialize those who did not survive the Holocaust and to honor those who did. What we learned through the years was, yeah, telling the Holocaust story and the story of the Holocaust was great, but we had to be relevant with what was going on today. Educating today's youth about the horrific events of the Holocaust is more important now than ever. Just as you see some people today condemning other people and other groups. We're trying to bridge the gap with uh, an exhibit like Change Begins With Me, where they can take the uh, issues of uh, the lessons of the Holocaust and, and relate them to issues that they are now reading about today. The interactive really helps you see what's going on recently. It showed that although those events were more than 70 years ago, things like this are still happening and that our job isn't done. And all of these people or these groups have taken action against prejudice and discrimination. It's important to me that I have something to show that I'm not speaking just as a storyteller. I'm speaking of something that actually physically happened to me and my family you go away with a different feeling and a different thought. How are you going to use our teaching you the lessons to make the world a better place? Who are you going to impact? It shows that as a person, you're not an individual, but you're a global citizen. It's your responsibility to help others. I think it's so important to spread awareness about these things and it's really easy, especially for young people, to feel like things like the Holocaust don't matter anymore, that they're in the past, but anti-Semitism, racism, and all kinds of things like that, they still exist and it's so important to learn about them and have these conversations and I think that the Holocaust Museum really triggers that. And I think we can all agree that living here in St. Louis, it's more relevant than it has ever been. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard and saw her in the video, and now she is here in person. Please welcome Ella Schmidt. Good evening. I'd just like to express how honored I am to be here with you tonight, and I'd like to thank everyone at the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center for providing me with this incredible opportunity. The Wednesday our ninth grade class went to the St. Louis Holocaust Museum, I woke up feeling grateful that the day would serve as a break from pop quizzes, note taking, and cramming for algebra midterms. The tired air, as sharp and unforgiving as it had been the day before, looked on bleakly as 115-year-olds arranged ourselves into familiar social factions, filling three groaning buses with our absent-minded chatter. Our conversation sounded routine, like we were reading off of a script. It felt weird to talk about where we were going, even if it was wrong not to. In a word, it was normal the kind of morning I would never remember if it weren't for the day that followed. 
I didn't even realize how uneasy I felt until our tour guide asked the group if we were nervous. Not one person raised their hand. The nerves bubbling up inside me were so turbulent that the idea of no one else feeling nervous was laughable. I knew I wasn't the only liar in the room. I was nervous that I would say the wrong thing at the wrong time and nervous that it was wrong for me to be nervous at all. The deaths of millions of people is nearly impossible to wrap your brain around, which makes it hard to hear and even harder to talk about. I think that's why I watched in awe as a Holocaust survivor spoke to 100 adolescents and countless additional adults about this very subject. Without any form of notes or outline, this woman spoke to us candidly and openly about the horrors she experienced firsthand, while still managing to be one of the most eloquent speakers I've ever heard. While her personal story provided this era with a direct element of tangibility, it also forced us all to remember that not one survivor or witness of the Holocaust can ever act as a spokesperson for the 11 million voices that the post-Holocaust world will never hear from. While we may often picture them among a sea of indecipherable skeletal bodies, each one of these voices represents a life, a family, and a brilliant mind of which the world was robbed. Around every corner of the museum was another concentrated dose of what it was like to be a Jew living, living in Germany during the Holocaust. From the despicable instances of propaganda spewed out by the German government to poignant images of the mass torment endured by Jews in concentration camps, this museum made the Holocaust much more palpable to a 15-year-old who was born in a different millennium than the, one in, than the one in which the largest hate crime in history occurred. This, I found, was the greatest value of experiencing the Holocaust Museum. It disallowed me to distance myself from this great hate crime and forced me instead to bear witness. As young people, we are all too easily detached from a history that is on our shoulders as much as anyone else's. With anti-Semitic incidents and hate crimes on the rise worldwide, the seemingly harmless mindset of forgetting the past in order to move forward is in fact dangerous and hints at the recurrence of darker times. If anything, educating today's youth about the horrific events of the Holocaust is more important now than ever, as we are the last generation who will ever have the opportunity to speak with a Holocaust survivor. I woke up feeling grateful for a break from a typical school day and came home grateful for the life-altering experience with which my fellow ninth graders and I were provided. The Holocaust Museum and Learning Center will play an imperative role in altering the perspectives of generations to come and I hope it will continue to expand the public's understanding of the Holocaust. Rather than dissociating ourselves from the past, it is everyone's responsibility to understand the relevance of the Holocaust. Only then can we truly move forward to a world without streets littered with hate crimes. Thank you. standing ovation out there. Thank you, Ella. Now for our final presentation. Jewish historian and philosopher Michael Friedlander once said, vision requires far more than the eye. It takes the whole person. For what we see is no more and no less than what we are. This statement applies to our dear friend and visionary, Gloria Feldman. After losing family members and surviving the Holocaust, her world was shaped by this tragic event and she became passionate about doing whatever she could to educate people about it. She has been at the forefront with us providing the resources we need to offer high quality education Holocaust education. She began by funding an educator's conference every year, allowing us to provide everything free of charge. If teachers outside the St. Louis region couldn't attend a conference, HMLC Holocaust educators 
could take the education workshops on the road to various school districts in the region and give teachers the tools they needed. In 2009, we started talking about how we could reflect the lessons of the Holocaust through contemporary issues and other genocides. Gloria was intrigued by this idea because she saw the importance of bringing relevance to Holocaust history. When we approached her about developing something really unique to our museum to address issues related to hate discrimination and ethnic conflict in today's world, Change Begins With Me was born. Because of her vision and generosity, we were able to bring our dream exhibition to fruition. She has been a force behind the establishment of the Rubin and Gloria Feldman Family Education Institute, which has allowed us to bring intellectual and financial resources together under the guidance of its stellar advisory committee. Representatives of local universities, education professionals, rabbinic leadership, and organizations committed to strengthening and diversifying our community meet regularly to share ideas. Some of our most creative programs and exhibits have been generated during those meetings. The Rubin and Gloria Feldman Family Education Institute has truly allowed us a seat at the table with many organizations to collaborate and partner, and for that we are extremely grateful. Gloria, will you join me on stage, please? The Visionary Leadership Award presented to Gloria Feldman with respect, respect and appreciation, you inspire us all. Kleenex. Water. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Ella. <sighs> I'm so humbled and very nervous, I must tell you. This is very, very, and extremely difficult for me to speak to you this evening. However, I am speaking on behalf of the millions who could not speak for themselves, for those who perished, for those who were never given the opportunity to speak, for the liberators who witnessed the horrors and could not speak about it. for the ones who did survive and can never forget the past. For my siblings, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, and cousins who were all murdered. My life was spared and I feel the obligation and responsibility to teach that change begins with me. I do not wish that anyone experiences the horrors that my family endured. Education has always been an important item to Reuben and me as it was to our parents. I chose the Education Institute to the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center 
to ensure that as the years go by, there will always be someone teaching and telling the stories that, that will no longer be able to have and to be heard from a person as I am speaking here before you. We have to teach about the atrocities, the deniers, the lost victims, but those, most of all about the stand buyers that didn't do anything. I have to thank Leo Wolf, who called me several years ago and said, you and Ruben have to become friends of the museum. And when Leo speaks, we listen, and we do. Rosalie Bresch encouraged me to come to the museum with her so I can meet Jean Cavender. And that's when my journey began. Thank you, Rosalie, wherever you are. I wish to carry on the vision of Leah Wolf, Tom Green, and the late Bill Count, the founders of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center. We must erase discrimination, hate, violence, and genocide. We must keep their mission alive with tikkun olam to repair the world. <clears throat> After many months of discussions with very four strong women, Jean Cavender, Margie Langa Khan, Carol Stenberg, and Marcy Rosenberg, they convinced me that I should and I could do this tonight. In addition, I'm also here because of advice given to me by someone, some very special people. At lunch with Tom Green one day, he told me that he set up a philanthropic family fund so he could make sure his children would be philanthropic. Michael and Carol Stenberg, two of the most generous donors, told me I had to attach my name to my causes with the hope that it would encourage and inspire others to get involved. It is so not my style. <laughs> However, when two generous people say, Gloria listens. And I fell for it, and here I am. <laughs> my <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Michael and Carol, Carol and Michael, am I doing it right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Education is the key to a better future. I would like to thank our wonderful staff, Jean, Dan, Andrew, our chair, Kent, our docents, teachers, and many, many volunteers for the difficult task of addressing day after day how to teach our community about the Holocaust and about genocide. It is my goal and mission to make sure that no one endures the suffering that I and many others experience. 
My childhood was taken away from me. I lost most of my family. But what I gained was determination and stubbornness. My promise to my family and all of you here tonight is this. I will do whatever I can to make sure that when a child or an adult comes to the museum, they will leave changed just as Ella did and is. During the difficult times, all I wanted was a pair of shoes to get through the winters and the heavy snow. What I now want is to make a difference. It is not what you have, it's what you do with what you have. I believe that I survived while hiding in the trenches, in the ghettos, and many camps for a reason. My mother and father saved my brother and me. This is my way of thanking them and honoring them. They always gave their small ration of bread to my brother David and me while we were in the camps. The four of us escaped many times from death. My parents hid us well, and by the time we were liberated, we were skin and bone and barely alive. I would like to see the Museum and Learning Center and strive, grow, and continue to educate many, many years. I am hoping that many of you will join me in making sure that this happens. I am so grateful. I have my children, my grandchildren, and for that I am so blessed. Tonight, I'm joined by my daughter Cheryl, who always reminds me that she's a blessing. And, in <laughs> and indeed she is. And sometimes she even wants to be my mother. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have experienced that. <laughs> my tall and handsome, brilliant grandson, Brian. I know, Brian, I'm embarrassing you, but oh well. Don't we all have brilliant grandchildren? <laughs> My wonderful brother David, and I can say this because I'm older, and usually he lets me have my way. Not always, but usually. <laughs> Our grand, my granddaughter Sarah could not be here tonight. She lives in New York and she actually has a job. <laughs> <laughs> my son Stephen could not, and his family could not be here tonight. They're in the state of Washington trying to survive the fires. This evening is not about me and my survival. It's about our children, our grandchildren, and the survival of Israel and its people and the people of the world. May the next generation learn from our history to love one another, not to hate. I want to leave tonight on a note of optimism. I'm encouraged by the many, many friends and guests here this evening. 
Make a difference. Remember, honor, act. Thank you for listening to part of my life. Story. Gloria said she was grateful. We are so grateful that she could be here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Gloria. You did great. That's it, she says. She's done. Well, we heard a lot of numbers tonight. 20 years since the opening of the Holocaust Museum, a half million visitors, a dozen or more programs. But the real measure of the impact of the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center is how it inspires young people to confront discrimination and promote human dignity, how it teaches about the dangers of unchecked hatred, and most importantly, how it encourages action, cultivating a sense of moral responsibility to respond in ways that make our world a better place. The poignant testimony we heard tonight in the video from the museum's young visitors, I think can give us all hope. They are the museum's legacy. By living lives of not just compassion, but action, they will inspire all of us to remember, honor, act, make a difference. Thank you for being here for tonight. Good night, and have a safe drive home. <laughs>